Hebrews chapter 1, just the first few verses here in the chapter. We want to look at our prophet, priest, and king, and God. Our prophet, priest, king, and God. This is a wonderful, wonderful verses, great verses. Open, I, nowadays all I'm doing is just preaching stuff that starts the book and ends the book. You know what I mean? <laughs> Doxologies and introductions, that kind of thing. No, but this is, this is great uh, truth. All wrapped around the Son of God. And uh, whether the preacher does it any justice tonight or not, the scripture itself is absolutely wonderful. And uh, it's, it's great. So let's look at it. Verse number one, let's read there. God, who at sundry various different times and in di divers or different manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being so much better, made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What we begin with here is the, the truth that God speaks. God speaks in verse 1. He spake in verse 1, we're told, and then he hath spoken. Verse 2 says, unto us. He's still speaking. And God's in the business of speaking and continues to speak. And when he speaks, things change. Uh, like take, for instance, Genesis chapter number 1. Ten times we're told that God said in that first chapter of Genesis, God said, and you see what happened. I mean, things changed, didn't they? He's got the power to do it. And he does it through speaking, uh, through the instrumentality of speaking. Uh, God is speaking. He's speaking today. He's speaking in the universe. And the universe declares the glory of God. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, we're told. And showeth His handiwork. Psalm 19 and 1. So God speaks that way. But we need more than that. God speaks in history. And He speaks not only uh, of the glory of God, but history speaks of the sovereignty of God and how that he's ruling and overruling things. And so uh, we see him in history and providence. But we need more than that. It then goes on to speak in Romans 2 of conscience and how that the conscience speaks to us. It speaks to the morality of God. What's right and what's wrong and, and uh, accuses and excuses, we're told in Romans chapter 2. Now, thank God for conscience. Thank God for creation. Thank God uh, for His providence and history and all that we know and seen, have seen in His unfoldings. But all of that still comes short of what we need. What we need is for God to speak in special fashion in a special way and he has done that and we're told in verse 2 that he's spoken by his son and that specifically references the revelation that came with the son of God the gospel message that came with the son of God and the fuller understanding and fuller light that came with the son of God God speaks. He communicates. Now communication can be short-circuited in one of two places. Either the one who's speaking is not being clear enough 
or the one who's hearing doesn't hear clear enough. One of the two. And let me make an announcement tonight that it's real evident where the shortfall is. It's not with God. God has spoken. God speaks. God does speak. And He speaks clearly and concisely. Uh, but we have hearing problems. And humanity has difficulty really picking up the signal of what God's saying. And uh, not only that doesn't much want to hear what God has to say. But God's spoken. And He's spoken His final word to us. And He's used that, that word, to that speaking uh, to reveal His truth, to communicate to us. And to bring deliverance for us. And it's through the Lord Jesus. So there's a comparison in verse 1 and 2. It speaks of, verse 1 talks about the older days. In the older times, older days, uh, there were prophets who spoke. And then in the new last days it's described as, God is speaking in His Son. He's spoken by prophets. And spoken by his son. It's uh, all of the Old Testament speaks of God's son. But now, like Hebrews talks about, we just more fully understand even what that Old Testament type and symbol and, and, and stuff means because the son of God came. Uh, like take for instance, just in the book of Hebrews, there are 31 Old Testament quotes. Some suggest by inference there might be 34 Old Testament quotes. All of them speak of the Son of God. His person. And His work. So you can study Hebrews and you're just going to find Old Testament passages that talk about Jesus. That's what it's about. That's what it's all about, the book of Hebrews. Uh, I, I will note, it just quickly, if you can with me, let me run a little rabbit. Will you let me run a rabbit? Uh, the Bible here speaks of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost speaking. Uh, look at chapter 1, verse number 5 through 13. We'll not read all those verses, but look at verse number 5. God is doing the speaking, and He's speaking in Old Testament Scripture. God the Father is speaking in Old Testament Scripture. Look what it said. For unto which of the angels said He, God, at any time, God the Father, Thou art my Son. It's evident that it's talking about God the Father, Right? I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, he bringeth into the world the first begotten into the world. It's talking about the father, and he's quoting Old Testament Scripture. So the Old Testament Scripture, God, it says, God the Father speaking. He's the one that's speaking in the Old Testament Scripture because he is the author of the Old Testament Scripture. Look, look at this third chapter, verse number 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, now who's speaking? The Holy Ghost saith, and now we have Old Testament quote of Scripture. The Holy Ghost is speaking in an Old Testament passage of Holy Scripture. It said, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, and it's a lengthy quotation of Psalm 95. He, the Holy Spirit is speaking in Old Testament written Scripture. Now look at verse number 11 of the second chapter. It says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he, and that he is Jesus. And it says, He's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, he's, Jesus is speaking. Saying, 
I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. And it's a reference to the Son. But it says that the Son is the one who's speaking in Old Testament Holy Scripture. You say, why do you go into all that detail? Because I love it. What it, what it amounts to is that there's the triune God. The Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all of them are speaking in Old Testament Scriptures. The great three in one, the true God. Now, so that immediately tells me that God the Father is God, God the Holy Ghost is God, and Jesus is God. And they are the author of Scripture. You okay with that? I know you already believe it, but I just need to say it. So the subject of the Old Testament is God. It's the same as New Testament. Old Testament, New Testament, the same. But the revelation of the Old Testament and the New Te Testament is different. In the Old Testament, we have truth that's to some degree veiled and hidden, we're even told. 2 Corinthians tells us the Old Testament truth is progressively given to humanity. But in the New Testament, we have truth in full revelation, more clearer revelation of Old Testament Scripture. We have final revelation. We have finished revelation. Truth is final God's not giving more revelation. He's closed the canon, as they would say. So, all of the Ellen White and Joseph Smith and all of the very new revelations of Jesus Christ that have come out in modern era are all wrong. God's final finished word came through His Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. He hath, verse 2, in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, capital letter Son. His Son is distinctly different than his, the other sons of God. The Bible does declare the children of God, sons of God, small s, lowercase s. This is proper name and title because he is different. Jesus is God's son in the sense that he is the only begotten son, capital S, of God. He is the only, he's unique, there's none other. He's the only one, the Son of God. There's no Son of God like this Son of God. Who was God to begin with. And then was miraculously conceived by a, in the womb of a virgin. By the Father and the Holy Ghost. And then was born of a virgin. And is still, even after he takes on manhood and humanity, he's still the God-man. He alone is this unique, begotten. So, now let's look at the list of things. Verse number 2. And three, particularly, the, the list of things that describe the Son of God and tell us, give us revelation about the Son of God tonight. First, he, and we'll bump through them. We won't take a lot of time with them. He is the God appointed heir of all things, we're told. Look at verse two. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir, H E I R, of all things. The Father has given an inheritance to this only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given him an inheritance. He's going 
to inherit everything. Everything in the material world, everything in the spiritual world, everything, period. I, it, it, it is an amazing thing to understand that those who are saved by the grace of God are a part of His inheritance. Ephesians 1 says. It, you, you read that and you go, I count. <laughs> Why is it that he, he, he's, he's thrilled that he's going to get me? You know? He's thrilled. He's thrilled that he's got me and he's going to fix me and he's going to, he wants to be with me. You ought to tell yourself that. If you're saved tonight, you ought to tell yourself. He's thrilled that he wants me. I'm, he's thrilled to have me. We're part of the inheritance. But he, the Father's given him an inheritance. The Bible does say in Romans chapter 8, 16 and 17 that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Listen, the verses. It says, Romans 8, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs. He's getting it all, and that means we get in on it all. We get in on all that He's getting. That's the revelation of Scripture. I know we don't have it all down here. I understand all that. We don't have it all. We do have some things, have inherited some things. We inherited the down payment of the inheritance. Ephesians 1 says that the Spirit of God is the down payment. So we have Him and He'll be enough until we get the rest of all that we're getting. And it's all because Jesus is appointed heir of all things. Romans eleven thirty six for says for of him and through him and to him are all things. Everything's going to Jesus. It is. You say I don't believe that. Well, just be an unbeliever. Then that's all I can tell you. Number two, he's the God appointed heir of all things. He is also the Creator of all things. It says by whom Jesus, by Jesus also he God the Father made the world, made the universe. He inherits it all, but He also made it all. The Son of God, He's the Creator. Now that tells me that He did not begin in Bethlehem. That also tells me that He was around before creation was made or created. <laughs> He's the Creator. He was not created. He's the eternal God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God. John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 14, and so on. So, He's the Creator of all things. Third thing I say about it, verse 3. Who be in the brightness of His glory, God's glory. He's, he's, he's the brightness of God's glory. That's a present participle which means continuous. It's just He's continually, presently and ever presently, He is the brightness of God's glory. What's God's glory? Well, it's His gloriousness. That's as simple as you can get. God's gloriousness. He is glorious. And Jesus is the perfect expression of that gloriousness. Let me read a couple verses. John chapter 1 and verse number 14 and 18 said, The Word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He's got the gloriousness that the Father has. Doesn't He? Verse 18. It says, uh, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father. He hath declared Him. He's the one that's shown, told, taught, displayed, lived the gloriousness of God. 
He fully reveals God. All right, number four. You ready? And he is the express image of his person. He's the exact representation of God's nature. Jesus is the exact representation. Now there's no sinner that could ever say that. Only the God-man could say it. That word, exact image, it's the word character, C-H-A-R-A-K-T-E-R, -A -A -E from which we get our word character. And it means, it was used to describe the stamping of a coin. You take, you take the image and then you stamp it on the coin and it's, it's a replica of that which was, it's the image, precise image of the stamp itself. That's the idea here. God, the Father, Jesus, Jesus could say, see me, you've seen the Father. Right? Because He is the exact image of the Father. The precise imprint of the essence of God. He's everything that God is. I would say that an image is not uh, the image and the image imprint would be two different things. And I would suggest tonight that God the Father and God the Son are the same in essence, but they are different also. Because there is distinction of persons in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But he's made of the same stuff that God the Father is made of. Number five. He uh, upholds all things by the word of his power. He's upholding all things by the word of... Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. And it's a present tense, so present active participle it is continued repeated he's always upholding all things right now he's upholding all things making it function making it operate he sustains all things everywhere he's the sustainer of the universe we could take the microscope we could take the telescope and we can look them over the microscope there are 53,000 species of protozoa. And if they tell us that there are two to 3,000 in each drop of pond water. So if you're drinking pond water, you're drinking those little boogers that are swimming around. You don't see them. But they're in there. If you get a microscope on a drop of water, you'll see them. Up to 3,000 in a drop. Little bitty boogers, aren't they? Amoeba, parmesium. And, and then if we were to take the telescope, our Milky Way has 200 billion stars. That's a pile. You can put 215 million Earths, if somehow we could open up the sun, we could put 250 million Earths, our Earth, inside, and they would fit. 250 million Earths in our sun. It's a pretty big ball of fire, isn't it? The Earth rotates at the speed of 1,000 miles per hour. I'm getting dizzy just thinking about it. We rotate around the sun 66,000 miles per hour. Like to get that on the drag strip, wouldn't you? <laughs> light travels at the speed of the speed of light is uh, 186,000 miles per hour per second.
That's fast. So I got to thinking, I thought, well, how far is 186,000 miles on the earth? So I'm thinking, well, you know, how much does it take to make one lap around? So I Googled it. And came to find out that it's 25,000 miles around the earth to get make one lap about. And se so that would be seven and a half laps around the earth. Seven and a half laps around the earth in a second. That's the speed of light. Traveling pretty fast, didn't it? And so all of this, Aaron, who holds it together? Jesus Christ. It's what we're told. And then the next good truth would be this. If he holds the universe together, 66,000 miles per hour around the sun, 1,000 mile per per hour rotation going on on the earth around the sun while we're rotating 160 light going that 186,000 miles per second miles per hour per second it, all of that going on and everything with the small detail of the parmesium and the massive universe of all that we've got if he can keep that intact Do you think he can tend to your life even when it might be spinning a little bit? It's verses like this that don't that, that cause me uh, to have calm when I continue to hear about global warming that's going to destroy everything. Because he's got it under control. If, if he wants to, he can just blow on it and touch the temperature. He's upholding all things by the word of his power. Number six. And then it says this. The sixth thing about it. When he had by himself purged our sins... You know the why the Lord Jesus came? To deal with sins. Who brought sin into God's creation? Humans. Sin is so bad that it cost God's Son His life to pay for it. It says there in the verse, it says in verse 3, it says... Uh, when he had by himself purged our sins. The word purged is used. That is really an Old Testament language to purge. The Old Testament sin is described as something that's dirty, something that is filthy, and the soul that sins had to be cleansed. Purged is the word. And the Word of God says here that sin has been paid for and the legal debt has been paid for and by that atoning payment a repenting, believing sinner can be purified in God's sight. Purified. That's what the rest of the book of Hebrews is all about. It's about a purification for sin. God's made a purification for sin. God's Son made the purification. It said by Himself. You cannot pay for sins. You can't beat yourself up enough to, to pay for it. So just quit it. You can't go to purgatory and somehow suffer you do some suffering that somehow will give credit to it. <laughs> it, it you, you can't do it. It's not by works. 
You can't go to hell and then God will let you out after a while because you suffered enough. No, no, you can't pay the payment. You're not qualified to pay the payment. There's only one who is qualified to pay the payment. And he by himself purged our sins at Calvary's cross. He paid the payment. There's only one payment. And he made it. And then the last thing about it. It says, Then he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus sat down up in heaven on the throne of God. That is amplified further in the book of Hebrews. It, the book of Hebrews talks about priests who never sat down because their work was never finished. Sacrifice made. All right, let's take a seat. No, no, no. Sacrifices have to be made. And another sacrifice has to be made. Animal sacrifices and that has to be made. Listen to the passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 11 through 14. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, Sit down <laughs> on the right hand of God. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He sat down. What do you have there? You have, in this, just these little verses, Jesus is the prophet. He's the final word. He's God's final word. Isn't he? He, had, he speaks God's final word to all of us. He's the prophet. He's the priest who offered the sacrifice for sins so that sinners could be forgiven. But he's also the king because he goes and sits on the throne in heaven after his resurrection and ascension. And not only is he king, but he's God by clear revelation. Even in these three simple verses we've looked at tonight. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. He's coming again. One of these days, up from the throne and down again. He's coming. He promised he was. So Hebrews 1 through 3, chapter 1, 1 through 3 introduces our prophet, priest, king, and God. So the f final question to ask of our hearts tonight is this. Is your prophet, priest, king, and God? Is, is he? I hope he is. Let's, let's stand. Larry Cowick, dismiss us tonight, please.
Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord Jesus.